talking about is literacy in the second tier of education just just as we have you know here a, you know a high people that strive and do very well and a test oriented educational system we have a lot of young people that fall away that don't don't thrive in that environment that doesn't mean they can't be wonderful performers they just don't thrive in that environment and Japan is a high stakes country and they have the exact same problem we have. And the, the, the difference is, is that they are, they are a homogenous, pretty homogenous culture. And they have 114 vocational schools. Uh, they, have a, they have more than that, but they have a, a chain of vocational schools that's made up of 114 schools. And they, and they use the vocational schools as a way of finding opportunities for young people to thrive and survive in, in, the, in the, that high stakes uh, culture. And so they're very interested in the kinds of things that we've been doing. And that's why we're going. So I think the more we, the, the more, the message here, at least something to take on the law, is that 
that there's really a great opportunity to, to democratize our economics and, and our real opportunities for people who really want to do things and be creative and contribute to society. And we, we have to broaden our understanding of what those, those assets are that are needed to contribute to the human history and our story. And if anything else we had to talk about today, the one thing that came across from everybody, from the most technical and most experienced, the most highly uh, acclaimed people, all the way to the young students here that were practicing and getting, getting their start in the field, it was storytelling. It was the importance of that over everything else, and the ability for us to make that connection with each other. Otherwise, we're, otherwise, I'm afraid, we'll be like the tree, the old story of the tree that falls in the, in the forest and no one hears it. And so, uh, uh, you know, I think to some extent that's what broad, the broadcast industry might be experiencing a little bit. So, anyway, to pass that on to David, are we ready to go? We're, we're ready to go. All right. So, thanks. Thanks again. And let's enjoy this and then let's get back together and convene after that. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Um, who's here from Boston English? Is it Boston English now? Ah, I used to be Jamaica Plain High. That's where my my brother uh, uh, graduated from. He's, he's now at uh, Channel 4. Well, hopefully everyone has had a wonderful day. We've got an exciting, we've got an exciting um, uh, uh, wrap up. We want to hear from you. We want it to be interactive. Uh, we're going to be speaking with Alan a little bit more. We have Ian Williamson somewhere from Hong Kong in the, in the uh, space. Christopher Fomigno and Erica Osiakwa will be here. I'm the founder of Shaman Education. I'm the board of directors of the Lawyers Project. And I work also nationally in access to justice here. So I've got a little bit of background in technology and access to justice. We're going to play a quick video here for one minute. Yo, Doc, what's up? This out was cracking, I'm killing. Oh. What you been doing? The last time I saw you, you were kind of bummed out from some of the things that you were learning. Oh, that? I guess I took it to the head a little bit, but I've been talking to more people since then. Did they tell you anything about what you were supposed to do? Yeah, they did. They had a lot of good ideas, too. They told me some big things that we should be doing and some small things. But most of all, they told me that you should really work harder for a better education and start voting for more old people like you. Yo, John, I'm not that old. <laughs> Yo, I'm a baller, shot caller. As a matter of fact, in the last election, it was teenagers just a little bit older than yourself that made a huge difference in the presidential campaign. They voted in huge numbers. They also helped in many of the political campaigns around the country. Yeah, true that, Rabbi, but they wasn't really talking about the political stuff. They was talking about small things like getting all people around our way and staying active in our community. They said that's what's really important. Word. How can we help each other if we don't know each other? <laughs> so, just to sort of start us off in, in picking up on some of the things that Alan was talking about, how important we all are to each other, and the importance of one thing that you'll do in your, when you become an adult, uh, of voting, playing a part in, in society. Now, I want to introduce Christopher Fomigno. Christopher Fomigno is a good friend of mine, and the reason why we're bringing him in is that um, uh, someone not too long ago asked me, or asked a friend about uh, a school, an alma mater in Bermuda, Cameroon, that uh, didn't have any computers. So with the help of Bob Doyle and others, we put together uh, some computers to go to this particular school in Cameroon. Now, Christopher Fomigno, in addition to having, uh, uh, being, having a master's in international law, 
uh, a PhD in political science and being the founder of the Fomenio uh, uh, Foundation. Um, he also is the uh, uh, Africa Regional Director for the National Democratic Party. Right, so let's, let's, let's hear from him first over here and then we'll, 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 we'll have him join us on Skype. using a 
SMS technology to transmit data and transmit information. Um, and also the, the concept of uh, variable tabulations, which uh, is a new methodology being used by civic organizations across Africa to enhance the credibility of electoral processes. So there are wonderful opportunities out there, and I think that the the fact that Africa at large, and I, I realize I'm just generalizing here, um, is green territory, uh, means that the challenges that the continent faces could very easily be transformed into opportunities. And that's why, on top of the work that I do with the National Democratic Institute, um, I've created a foundation in my home country to provide those opportunities at the grassroots level, uh, and I'm delighted to say that in the next few months, uh, we'll be partnering with David and his organization uh, to help in support uh, a technology laboratory in part of Cameroon. Yes, uh, so, I, I did. Uh, I did share with uh, Christopher um, with the group. Uh, initiative and we're, we're all excited about that and you know one of the things that I've always been interested in is the idea of uh, dreams and hope and I, I think it's one of the things that we somewhat take for granted here in our country and uh, how important uh, I, I you know I think that this opportunity is to be able to provide uh, internet service and uh, computers to the young people in uh, Bomenda uh, towards um, uh, their ability to have dreams and hope. Can you speak a little bit about that? Sure. I, I think it's, it's a wonderful opportunity, um, especially because young people in Cameroon and across Africa uh, are competing with young people from across the globe. Uh, with the advantages of globalization, have also come this level of competi competition. Um, and sometimes, you know, even when they have to apply uh, for admission in universities abroad, uh, they have to do that through technology and internet. And young kids, as brilliant as they may be, if they don't have developed these skills very early on in their lives, these of on some of these opportunities which would define them for the future. So giving them these opportunities very early on in their lives opens all kinds of doors to them, but also guarantees that later on they can help lift up many of these countries uh, which are looking for brighter, uh, brighter leadership uh, in the years ahead. Well, thank Christopher, thank you. Let me ask, does anybody have any questions for, for Christopher? Yes. So, um, what's happening over there in Africa, you know, due to the, uh, the restrictions of technology, is, is that, like, the main reason why they're going, like, that's why, like, pe people are, like, um, voting on paper because of the technology restrictions, correct? So uh, let me let oh, me sorry let me let me let me uh, no I'll come back to you. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, Christopher, we have a question. Um, I've got the first part of the question. It's are are people in Africa are the is the system that they they're voting on on paper? Are they voting on paper or are they voting electronically? Well, um, there is not yet a country on the continent that has adopted electronic voting. Uh, technology is being introduced into the electoral process gradually on an incremental basis. So in the initial stages such as voter registration, voter cards, biometric data, and the transmission of election results that has been done electronically, where across the continent voting still takes place manually. Mm -hmm. Okay, Christopher, I still have uh, more of a question. Yes, go ahead. Does that, does that help? Yes, that, that actually does help. Um, that, that question, you know, it's supposed to be a two-part question depending on the answer given, but um, I have no question. Thank you. Thank you.
email? Well, Christopher, thank you so much for joining us. And um, looking forward to our, our work in the future and reporting back on, on how we've done. Well, thank you, David, for giving me the opportunity. And I really appreciate all of you caring about the concern and being ready to go out there and do wonderful things. Thank you, and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Washington, D.C. The, the National Democratic Institute is an organization chaired by Madeleine Albright, and he uh, is responsible for the African section of that organization, which deals with worldwide issues. So, so he's based here. He's, he's based here. He does a lot of travel back to Cameroon. And uh, it's just a, a fortunate thing that someone asked about the computers, and then I knew him with the radio station and put it on the map, and it wasn't too far. So, <laughs> with the work that uh, I have the uh, great honor of doing with Bob Doyle, I learned a lot about uh, 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 wireless, and we'll take that learning into Cameroon in order to create that wireless. Uh, Michael, uh, as you know, um, I'm sorry, Alan Michael, as you know, the founder of uh, uh, Homey, is a founding member of the Alliance for Media Literate America, and he, he's got some some thoughts. But we, before we do, let's let's click on that on that picture of Michael. Is there something, Michael, here? Oh, it looks like there's a plug in needed. But is there something, do you see where we are now? Is there something there that, that you think would be appropriate to share? Uh, that, may, that may be a music video for Get the Facts About AIDS. I'm not sure what it's Let's see if we can put this in. It's not time for a while. Oh, it's not? Yeah. Well, while <laughs> um, well, if we go back to the slide, I think, or, or actually. No, that's it's, Alan, that was it's on you. That was another one. Okay. Well, Alan, Alan, what, you know, I know you had some, some questions about today. Um, well, with David, David called me last night and he said, Alan, can you tell me, <laughs> can you tell me what you, in two, two sentences, can you tell me what, what, um, what you would hope the conference would mean? And, and I groggily said. <laughs> two sentences? <laughs> I said, all right, well, I threw this out. Let's see what did I say, David. Uh, how, can it, how can it help us reorganize our thinking and support one another, building the confidence to look through the door? I, 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 I think somehow you were sleeping, too. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, I think what I probably was getting at is, is that I think, I think we, ha we, have to take, we, we have to take risks. Uh, and, you know, with media, it's often, it's one of the, it's one of the things that you don't take, you don't need to take many risks with. It's kind of, you know, you can make a video and you can do all this work and you can have it. And if you put it in a can somewhere, it's not going to affect anybody. You made your video, you've gone, you've gone through this whole thing. It's not like building a building that's going to fit in a place somewhere. And people are going to have to figure out how the roads are going to go around it. And, you know, it's in the real world. So. I think sometimes with media, we, we, we tend to just kind of make what, 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 what is comfortable, what fits in the stream, where we'll send it out and it'll go, and you know, the PSAs and all that stuff. It's sort of, we're filling, filling the air with a lot of stuff that uh, maybe doesn't mean that much and, and hasn't taken that much effort. And I just think that we can take risks now. We, sh we should take risks now to find a way to get everyone engaged in a broader discussion and have media help us to do that. It has the ability to capture the ideas and put them in the archive so that you can think about them. You know, you can look at them over and over again. So you, you're, not, you're not forced to process something in real time and make a decision. You can, it has a lot, of, a lot of capacity for us to be much more thoughtful 
in what we do and how we do it, particularly in education. I learned that when, uh, years ago when I, when I did a project at uh, one of the, uh, at the Jeremiah Burke High School. And uh, what we did is we had the kids doing interviews about the change in their school. And we captured all these ideas. And, and I was present in many of them. And I remember realizing that I didn't remember these conversations and the amount of detail that I would have needed to to make use of the information that we had got by just kind of recording these little, these little interviews. And I just think that we, we have so many processes that we can, that we can employ that we have at our hands as experts and as young people coming up, you'll be, you'll be creating this so easily. I mean, you have access to this and you'll be able to create this. So I just hope that you'll think about that and that, that maybe that'll come out of, um, that maybe if this, if this conference does anything, it kind of lets you think, well, maybe I can open that door and maybe I can find a way to take some risks and not be afraid to do something that really might make a difference because I think there's so many opportunities to do that right now with where we are in the industry. And that is the power of one. That, that, that was really what we were getting at with the idea of power, power of one. It, 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 not only do we have the flip classroom and a lot of flip other things, but right now, I mean, media has always been mass media. One to many. You know, it's a centralized authority or organization to generate media and distribute it to everybody. It's been one way, now it's become two way, now it's becoming one way the other way. It's the power of one. We all have that capacity. And you can see it. I mean, earlier this morning, was it Scott? Was it you that showed the? Was it you that showed the video of the? I mean, I'm not sure if it was you. Some one of one of the presenters showed a video that had been shown, uh, been watched by 30 million people. Oh, Justin. Showed. Yeah, Justin. 30, right at the beginning, right? That's right. So 30 million people, and it was, it wasn't anybody famous. It was. So I mean, that's just an example. Of course, it's not going to happen to everyone, and he made that very clear. But the but the point is, is that there there are people listening. And there are ways to communicate, and we can we can make a difference. And I, I, I you know, that's the optimism of, of the whole idea of the conference. And that's, I guess, what I feel is, is the way we should we should be approaching things. So anyway, that that's my. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank well, you. Had a good thank you, Alan. <laughs> By the way, Michael, you'll be able to go 
at any time back to this presentation, you can click on the links to read more and learn more about it. Uh, uh, more recently, Eric has been involved in, in, in investing. He's co-founder of Angel Fair Africa, as well as managing partner of Chanzo Capital. So through that, that early experience being, uh, uh, having a tough time, uh, but turning that into a positive, I had the opportunity to meet Eric. And Eric is going to come up and speak with us now a little bit about what he's doing and uh, his hopes and dreams for you. All right. Thank you very much, David. And uh, I also want to congratulate the organizers for putting this together. I think this is a very, very important event, and I want to share a little bit of my experience. I'll make it very short, but I will say some pretty um, uh, big highlights of my career, and then I'll welcome some questions. I think uh, my previous speaker, Chris, uh, sort of uh, mentioned, uh, touch on some of the issues that I will touch on a little bit. So uh, I, I will say that when I was former uh, president of AFRISPA, what we set out to do was to help build internet service providers around the continent of Africa. Essentially, the ethos of that was to connect Africa to the rest of the world. Um, so in the late 90s, Africa was not connected to the internet. That's one of the pioneers that brought connectivity to the continent. Um, by 2007, we had gotten into building submarine cables as a way of increasing the broadband connectivity because before we were connecting to satellites or so serrated <coughs> slope. And that really opened up the continent and led to the whole idea of how do you now apply <coughs> technology to daily life. So now you're connected, what do you do with it? Uh, in the famous song of, now that we found out, what do we do with it? So what do we do with this? And so I went ahead and got involved in um, the African election <coughs> portal, which is one of the first things I did because as you all know, Africa's challenge is a governance challenge, it's a leadership challenge. So we built this portal, and the idea behind it was to be able to monitor and report on elections effectively. We're using SMS, we're using mobile, and we're using um, the web. Now, one of the interesting statistics that you need to pay attention to is uh, preceding this, in 1998, there were more landlines in Manhattan than the whole of Africa. A decade later, in 2009, there were more cell phones in Africa than the whole of the United States. And today, there are more cell phones in Africa than the whole of the United States. So something that happened over a decade where Africa had lived from, from no landlines to cell phones. And so most people in Africa were connecting by a cell phone. They were seeing the web by their cell phone. So Africa became not only a mobile first, but a mobile only continent and a mobile web continent. So most people can have a computer, they can buy a bit expensive Apple laptop, but you have very simple small feature phones that have become smartphones, and today they're about $50. And so a lot of the younger generation that you see in Africa are actually interacting with, with the web through the cell phones. And so you're getting into the internet in a very, very different way from the way you got into it. And that is enabling a lot of the application that we're seeing, which is extremely mobile enabled. So you will see that most of these applications use uh, the mobile uh, features. So is it a feature, um, a feature phone with a web app or a web app that talks, uh, uh, that has a, you know, uh, a non-web feature. So the African election also, what we did was that we found a way where reporters in remote parts of Africa can actually report the elections and send the results using their cell phone, either through SMS, and in some cases, where we could find web connectivity through web enabled applications. And so, what was happening was that we started getting more transparency in the election results. Because no matter what happens with the tampering of the results, is, the results are announced in a rural part of Africa, uh, Party A won, by the time it gets to the election headquarters, Party B has won by a very high margin. So, something happens between transmitting the result. But now, with the mobile technology, immediately it's announced, it's there in the capital city. So, it's very hard to tamper with. And that's what we try to achieve with the African election fault. And as Chris said, this has led to better credibility. And we saw in Nigeria, the most recent election, that it was a very credible election where the opposition for the first time came to power in a non-contested election. Actually, the city president con 
considered defeat even before the electoral commission announced the final result because it was very hard to tamper with election results. Mm -hmm. So this is a way that technology and availability of broadband is enabling governance, transparency, um, etc. And then one more point, and that before I go to the next point, is that to your question, um, we have now begun to introduce biometric uh, registration into the electoral system. So in Ghana, for example, in our last election, we now have a biometric system. Uh, which we employ. So yes, the elections are still, uh, we still put it on paper, but we have a bi biometric registration system, so now the same thing is more my fingerprint and access trial. So it, hopefully we'll get to the point where we can vote uh, electronically, which will be uh, more transparent. But I think that we also have to take the uh, electro, uh, electronic voting with some level of, uh, some pinch of salt, because it's not a foolproof technology. Right? It can also be tampered. So we need to keep that at the back of our mind. <coughs> So I'll speak on two more things I've been doing, and, um, um, which I think builds on um, the fact that now we're seeing a lot more of the youth, the younger generation, the digital natives and the millennials, expressing themselves by building these applications. And now they say, well, I think I can build the next Google. I can build the next Facebook. Uh, and that's really powerful. Because no matter what you see with the, uh, the youthful generation, you know, a decade ago is, Oh, how can I go to the United States? How can I get a job after school? How can I move to Europe? But that mindset is changing because the younger generation are beginning to realize that with technology I can see the world and I can actually compete globally. So what I've been doing is I, I've been, uh, I started investing and mentoring some of this new generation of entrepreneurs uh, by bringing my experience but also investing a little bit of my own money in, in helping them to realize their dreams. So a lot of people come to me, I have this idea, I want to build this app. One of them I need to tell you about is mobile money. How many of you have mobile money? Okay. So you know in the worst, most of your transactions are either by debit or credit card. So you never had credit history, that sort of stuff. In Africa, this was very hard. So most economies were cash based, right? Most people transacted by cash. And the introduction of debit or credit card was very hard. You know? A company called Safari, a company called Vodacom in South Africa introduced something called prepaid airtime. What that meant was that, unlike here where you have a phone, you use it at the end of the month, you get a bill and you pay. Right. They said, how about you can buy the airtime before? You prepay it and then you load it onto the phone. And then you use it. So when you finish, if you bought one dollar, if you finish it, you can use the phone anymore. Right. Now that really caught on with a lot of Africans because people didn't have credit risk history or because the bank people didn't want to address. Right? Now, fast forward, Safari come another company in Kenya then built on that and said, well, if you have this stored um, prepaid at time, it's actually virtual currency. So they introduced a technology by SMS where now you can convert the airtime into mobile money. And it's called M-Pesa. Now, so most Africans, even in remote parts of Africa, now are able to transact online using mobile money. Mm -hmm. And now, I'm not surprised a lot of you don't know it, but that's the next thing that you'll be getting used to very soon. Yeah. Very <laughs> soon, you'll be doing mobile money on your phone. And guess what? You're learning it from the developing world. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the way where Africa is leapfrog again. This time, not connectivity, but in the creative digital economy. So I actually argue that Africa is going to produce the next most powerful technology company in the world. Um, and the 21st century is Africa century. And I said Asia should move, move aside. <laughs> because Asia's century was the 20th century. The 21st century, you're going to see more and more technology innovation and interesting applications coming out of Africa be just because of necessity and the availability of technology. And the fact that the youthful generation that you see in Africa are unleashing their creativity and they're applying technology to the daily challenges that they face. And some of these challenges are applications that you can use globally. So I mean, I set the Angel for Africa as a platform to bring these entrepreneurs to pitch to angel investors so that the, um, the investors can see some of these applications and invest in the same way I invest. So if you go to our website, Africa, uh, Angel for Africa, we did the last event on the 5th of November. And at the event, one deal happened on the spot. One of the investors invested in one of the companies that pitched at the event on the spot. Was, we've done it three times, this is the third time. The first two, we had deals happening after, but this time there was a deal on the spot. 
And after the event, there was another deal. So there's been two deals so far since we started uh, within this event. And this is one of the pictures from the last event. Um, this guy is an MIT graduate. Uh, a friend of mine I met so many years ago, he started a company called Express Pay. He wasn't the one that got the investment, but you can see these guys come up and they pitch the ideas. And we had investors from the African American Angel Capital Association, African Venture Capital, uh, African Private Equity and Venture Capital Association. We had come, uh, investors from New Generation Angels all in the room. Um, and so this is a way where we are bringing the organization of entrepreneurship into current availability of capital. Right? And this is going to create a next generation of technology companies coming from Africa and then going to the world. So on the back of that, I also started Shanzo Capital, which is my fund. And essentially what we're trying to do on Shanzo Capital is now I'm investing in other people's money. So I've proven the concept by investing my own money. And now I'm a fiduciary investing in other people's capital into this next generation of entrepreneurs uh, that are going to build the next big company out of Africa. But to end, you ask me, but Africa is 54 countries, right? You guys know that, right? Or you think Who <laughs> <laughs> thinks Africa is one country? OK, yeah, it's 54 countries. So again, the question in your mind is, how do we find which country to invest in? Which countries are the, more interest, the most interesting when it comes to digital technology? They are the countries that I call the kings of Africa. How many of you know, know the Asian tiger concept? Have you heard of Asian tigers? Yeah. All right, so Asian Tag is a concept that was used to describe the highly free and liberalized economics of Asia when Asia emerged in the 20th century, and it was Hong Kong, Taiwan, uh, Malaysia, South Korea, and Taiwan. Now, with the emergence of Africa in the 21st century, I give that there are five countries that are the leading lights of the digital economy in Africa. And they are the kings of Africa. So we have the Asian tigers and I have the African kings. <laughs> Similar to the BRICS or the mint concept. So I'm going to give the last test and let's see whether you pass, whether you really know Africa. So the keys is K I N G S. So let's go. K stands for Kenya. Oh, great. You are great people. <laughs> All right. I stands for. Oh, yeah, you got it. You got it. You got it. It's always I is the most difficult. I recall the Francophone country most people don't know about is I. I recall you got it. Uh, N is for Nigeria. Great. G is for Ghana. Oh, you guys make me so proud. And S is for Senegal. South Africa. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. It's always called Senegal, South Africa. Very South Africa. But Senegal also. Anyway, so those are the kings of Africa's digital economy. And these are the countries leading the technology revolution we're seeing on the continent. Thank you. Is Ian around? No, we're not able to contact him. Well, I just want to. I just want to little indulge you. I just want to ask uh, my mentor, uh, Bob Doyle, to come up for a couple of minutes. Um, Bob. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, are you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, just He's working. Just I'll push it to me and leave it there. Carter will take it. Carter will take it. I got it. Jimmy, I got it. Bob, 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 can't tell you how much I love him and his, his family. It's meant so much to me. And I know that he's put his his heart and his soul into into uh, the work today and the learning today. So I wanted to, to as we close, to just get a couple of thoughts from you and uh, give the uh, uh, an opportunity to ask you any questions. Well, they've asked me some before, but yeah. can you show your global localism piece that you did for Hi, I'm David Pearson, Executive Director of Shamit Education. As a formerly homeless American, who learned database and web technology to build bostonhomeless.org, a resource of over 150 shelters and food programs that is maintained by our students. It was my pleasure in December of 2002 to visit Jamaica. 
I met with the Minister of Technology, Philip Paulwell, and others from the Education Ministry, the Information Ministry, as well as the Department of Corrections to train them in SkyBuilders tools. I also trained approximately 15 Jamaicans on how to build their own web pages and websites. In January 2003 at Harvard Law School, the Berkman Center for Internet and Society discussed this question. Can Jamaican music published by Jamaicans on the World Wide Web help economic development in Jamaica? That's, that's, that's it for, for now, but thank you all, okay, for, for coming. Yeah. Yeah.